What does it mean when a video game causes us to feel self-doubt? What's happening when a game forces us to look in a mirror and question what it is that motivates us? I never thought a game less than two hours in length could cause me to face these difficult issues head on, and yet here I am. This is the beginner's guide, and if I had to describe the game in a few words, I'd call it a narrative-focused first-person adventure. In reality, the experience is almost entirely psychological, and it communicates a very powerful message that will likely mean different things to different people. My name is Nick Moe, and what you're about to see is a collection of gameplay, public speeches, and blog posts that, when combined, form a very interesting story. One that you might have missed out on since the Beginner's Guide originally launched back in October of 2015. That said, if you've not played the Beginner's Guide, and you have any intention to, go ahead and add this video to your Watch Later playlist, and go play the game first. It's okay, I'll be here. And with that out of the way, let's get started. If you've played the Beginner's Guide, then you have a basic grasp of its story. The loose premise is that you're playing a collection of unfinished indie games from a developer by the name of Coda. And we are experiencing these games with context thanks to a narrator, a man by the name of Davey Whedon. In this regard, the game presents itself as a biographical piece. The game's plot involves at least one real person, implying that what you're playing is non-fiction. And this is part of the reason why making this video has intimidated me. I'm not just breaking down characters in a game, I'm breaking down real people. And speaking of real people, I'd like you guys to meet our narrator, Davey. This is Davey Reedon. He is the creator of The Stanley Parable and of The Beginner's Guide. His games are known for being experimental storytelling devices. Here he is giving a talk at Alto University on how his personal experiences shaped his games. During the talk, Davey talks about his battles with depression and how hard it is to live up to the expectations of others. The entire talk is over an hour long. It's pretty interesting to hear his experiences, but there's one key takeaway I want to make sure you gather from this talk. Listen to what he has to say here. I was literally weeks away from abandoning game development and just running a bar somewhere when the free version of Stanley Parable hit the internet and suddenly overnight I had tens of thousands of eyes on me. So wow, what does that do to a person? Now you might look at these two details and say, gosh, that sounds great. Sounds like everything is going to work out really awesome for you. And in theory, yes, you're right. But the problem is that validation is not a vaccine. You don't just take it once and then the disease goes away. You have to keep taking it, like hunger. It returns every single day. You cannot sate the desire to be praised. At this point, we can make an assumption. Unless Davey is on stage lying to a group of hopeful college students, we can assume that what he's telling us is true. That prior to the success of his first game, The Stanley Parable, he felt hopeless. But after The Stanley Parable became a runaway success, the spotlight and attention he received caused him to suffer from depression and anxiety. This is a real person, and these are his real-life experiences. Now, normally these sorts of things would be off-limits in exploring a game, but what we've been presented in the Beginner's Guide isn't a fictional story. We were led to believe that these events actually occurred, therefore, Davy's speech is entirely fair game. I want you to keep that in mind as we leave the real world and enter the one presented to us in the Beginner's Guide. At the very beginning of the game, we receive an introduction from Davy, who uses his real name and gives us personal details to ensure that we are all under the impression that what we are hearing is a true story. He quickly introduces us to an acquaintance of his by the name of Coda. Coda, like Davy, is an indie game developer who is involved in experimental game design. Davy informs us that what we are about to play are a series of Coda's unfinished games, which Davy has compiled so that others could experience them. Right away, it all seems incredibly real, and we have no reason to assume that what we are hearing could be anything but the truth. Early on, we are presented with some of Coda's first works, a map for Counter-Strike, some basic Source Engine puzzle games. Davy even goes so far as to using the Source Engine as a major plot point, indicating that the limitations of the Source Engine are partly what influenced the direction of Coda's games. Anyone with any sort of experience with game development or who follows the games industry closely will likely resonate with what Davy is telling us. These details in the Source Engine are all 100% true, and many real-world developers got their start by experimenting with Source mods. What we are hearing seems incredibly plausible. Not long after the game's introduction do we realize that Davy has taken it upon himself to modify some of Coda's games in ways that make them easier to understand. Davy explains to us that he did this so that others could experience the brilliance of Coda's work, 
and that he did it to help Coda. Now things are beginning to become more convoluted. If these are Coda's games, would Coda approve of any of these changes? And by adding changes, has Davy changed what these games were supposed to be? At this point in the story, we have our doubts about Davy's motives. Despite him telling us that he was looking out for Coda's best interests, we can't help but feel that Davy is motivated by more personal reasons. After we've explored at least a half dozen small experimental games, the tone of these titles begin to shift. The games become less optimistic and more fearful, more doubtful. As the intensity increases, so does confusion. The games are looking less like video games and more like direct cries for help. The games are all about being trapped or facing destruction head on. The gameplay becomes violent, or at least metaphorically violent, as you're forced to lie to yourself about your happiness. At this point, our own human logic begins to interfere with the story unfolding before us. Davy claims to be Coda's friend, and he states that he cares about Coda very much, yet he claims to have played these games that are so clearly direct cries for help, yet he never intervenes in the real world? And if Davy wouldn't intervene, wouldn't someone else? Or is Davy truly the only person playing these games? If this was any other video game, we wouldn't need to ask ourselves these questions. Suspension of disbelief would normally carry us through parts of a fictional story that don't quite add up. But this game is supposed to be non-fiction, right? The events of this game involve real people, or so I was told. I mean, right now, I could tweet at Davy Reed and I, I could look up who Coda is, right? Okay, now imagine that you show up at the party and you're tired, or it's loud, or you've got something else on your mind, and there are 200 people who all want to have that conversation with you. And yes, you could turn around and just leave the party, go back home where it's quiet, except for one very big problem. This is what you've always wanted. You know it. You know in your heart of hearts that you have always wanted this, for everyone at the party to come to you. You've been dreaming of this for years. You don't have the energy, so what? This is what you always wanted. This is why you started making games in the first place, isn't it? Isn't this why you've been making stuff? So that you could be at the party and 200 people would all want to talk to you? That sounds great. You have to talk to all of them. You have to. Talking to them is the only important thing. It's the only thing that matters. You've been telling yourself this for years. Talking to them is the only thing that matters. Perhaps it was wrong to approach this game with any sort of assumptions at all. You probably understand where we are at this point. There never was a developer named Coda. that the story we've experienced in the Beginner's Guide was largely influenced by Reden's own experiences. And the evidence is a bit hard to ignore. Take Coda's games for example. So many of them share a common theme, a sense of fear of being judged a hatred for performing in front of others, a fear of the press. For a person whose games were never advertised publicly and who's never been wildly successful, they display an odd amount of attention towards the press and the gaming public. On the other hand, Davy himself has received an insane amount of media attention when his game, The Stanley Parable, became a smash hit. To most, the story ends right here. Coda never existed, and the story of the Beginner's Guide is just the story of Reden's life after the Stanley Parable, and how he failed to succeed under the enormous pressure of having a successful game. However, I think there's more. If the ending of the Beginner's Guide is anything to go by, I believe the message of the Beginner's Guide is a positive one. I believe that Davy created the concept of Coda to help tell a story. A lot of people believe that Coda's name is no accident, that Davy chose this name because of its meaning in music, where a coda is an end to a musical passage, and there may be some truth in that. To me, coda represents Reden's purely creative ambitions, the side of him that wants to create games that are psychological experiments, not AAA million unit selling blockbusters. Coda represents Davy's unafraid, passionate creativity. In the story, Davy casts Coda as a real person, a tragic figure, so that we feel a sense of loss when he loses contact with Coda, 
We feel sorry for Davy, yet at the same time, we don't realize that the loss was all internal. The only thing that was lost was Davy's sense of purpose. The public facing Davy is his other half. This is the side of him that's craving the praise and attention of others. This is the person who wants to become an internet sensation for his games, who wants to give talks and be looked up to by other developers. And as I hinted at before, it is this side of Davy that makes Coda disappear. It is the need to alter the games for a mass audience, the need for more sales on Steam, the need to do more interviews and more public events that causes the conflict on display in the Beginner's Guide. And this is the main point I hope you take away from all of this, that at its core, the Beginner's Guide is not about a narrator walking you through someone else's games, that the Beginner's Guide is about a single person facing an internal struggle on what it is that drives their creativity. And this conflict is the reason why Davy loses touch with Coda. Thankfully, the game does not end with Coda's disappearance. The game's final chapter is a silent epilogue during which you have the time to reflect on everything you've heard. The game comes to a dramatic finish when you walk into a light, similar to one we've seen earlier in the game, and the player rises into the stars, revealing a dazzling, infinite maze below. This powerful imagery reminds players of the meaning behind one of Coda's first games, that the world is bigger than we realize, and that what we know to be true may in fact only be a small piece of the actual truth. In this powerful moment, we realize that our journey, everything Davy told us and everything we saw, shouldn't be accepted as the entire truth. For that every one path here, there is an infinite amount of other paths we could have taken, or conclusions we could have reached. After this uplifting sequence ends, the game is over. But before we end this one, there's a final question that we need to ask ourselves. Why is the game that we just played titled The Beginner's Guide? The title is wide open to interpretation, but here's mine. I believe the title is to be taken two ways. The first is a literal interpretation of the experience you've just played. You are stepping through the first gameplay experiences made by a novice game designer, and you are being guided through them step by step showing how one game improves over another. At the same time, the title refers to the internal struggle of a young creative mind. You're learning how an incredibly creative person can be crushed under the immense pressure of having an audience. You've learned that you must respect your creative process and never allow external forces to shape your creations or you might lose what it is that drives you. I'm relaying this to you to try to illustrate for you what is at risk. If you're not being mindful about why you're making the things that you're making, what do you stand to lose? How bad could it really be? This is what the beginner's guide means to me. The game forced me to take a look at my own creative processes and ask myself what motivates me? What pushes me forward? Is it my own creativity? Or is it a thirst for external validation? Ultimately, we can't be sure that this self-reflective message was the original intent when Reed and released this game, and that's probably for the best. The Beginner's Guide took me on a journey, and I feel stronger as a creator because of it. A big thank you to all of you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I will just say that this was one of the strangest videos I've ever produced, but the game was just that good. I really wanted to take it there. If you're interested in how games work, but you're looking for something a little lighter, you should check out my video on why challenging games like Seam feel so good. And if you want to see my next video as soon as it launches, be sure to subscribe. New videos drop every other Thursday. That's it for me. I'll see you guys in the next one.